this is a unique sutta because it addresses the recollections. It is about the advice that Lord Buddha gives to a layman on how to bring the mind back, bring the mind back, bring the mind back. We have a term for that, it's called sati. In English, a very loose term is recollection, recollection. In Pali, the word is anussati, anussati. That's not the name of the sutta, of course, today, but it is about anussati. And it comes from the book of the sixes, from the Anguttara Nikaya, the numerical discourses. And because it is from the book of the sixes, it means that whatever is going to be listed, it will be six. If it were book seven, it would be seven things. If it would be book eleven, it would be eleven things. We owe that to the uh, noble uh, first council Arahans, who pretty much packaged it, the, gave it the rough shape of the suttas to begin with. But why recollect? Why? Why do we need to recollect anything in the first place? Because we have a tendency of forgetting, don't we? We have the tendency to always forget, to occupy our minds, our hearts with something else. And we have excuses for them, of course. Well, this is an important job. This is an important relation. I have to take care of this. Well, our whole lifetime goes by with a series of, well, I had to take care of this. Series, countless, countless. Unfortunately, we don't recollect them all. That's why it makes it look like it's nothing. Until you look in the mirror and it's been 87 years of, well, I had to do something else. And it was compelling. Bhante, it was compelling, Lord Buddha, whatever it is that you are addressing. So Anusati. We have the tendency to forget because when it comes to the Dhamma, we are going to be going against the stream, Mara's stream, the world's stream. It goes against the Dhamma. The world goes against the Dhamma. The world as you know it, the job, the position, it goes against the Dhamma. Why? Because it pulls you out of whatever truly matters, which is reduction of suffering to the point where you overcome it in the form of cutting the cord to samsara. Ultimately, that's it. But you cannot do that even through recollection even through recollection. Now, recollecting what? We're going to see a series of six different recollections. Of course, three of them are very obvious. We do that all the time. Buddhang, Dhammang, Sanghang. Three. And then we have the other. Those are a lot more personal. Have to do with us. Sila, Dana, and then the Devas something that no one wants to touch these days in this very modern world and everybody wants to be part of the crowd the mob mentality whatever is selling today on the streets that's the ideology we will subscribe to so this sutta is an invitation back to really what matters so it takes recollecting constantly in order for you to keep yourself able to withstand when there is a Niagara type of a waterfall current coming at you. It's not easy to practice Dhamma. It's very easy to convince yourself you're practicing through rites and rituals though, right? Especially when the rites and rituals are nicely delineated, pointed out on a calendar. 
You know, on this and this and date, you know, there's a new moon, full moon, new moon, full moon, Uposha Tahir, Vesak there. All these things make it so nice and perfect, nicely packaged. And you go and you do whatever is ex expected of you. And you feel good because others are doing it. Not just in your city, in your country, in that part of the world, in fact, around the world. Anyone who calls themselves a Buddhist, for example, is doing it on this day. So, and I'm doing it so I feel good. How could that be bad? Could it? Recollection is not that. So I need you to set your North Star, your GPS system, correctly from the very beginning of delving into the Sutta. That's not recollection. Some people say, just saying, let's say, Buddha, Buddha, Buddha. It is a very good use of the Buddha Sati, for example, the recollection of the name of the Buddha. But many, 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 many people keep that on the surface level. Same thing for the Dhammo. The Dhamma, or the Sangho, the Sangha, or the Dana part. Well, I, I, I paid, uh, you know, the temple. In fact, I, uh, before I die, I'm going to give all my possessions to the temple. I have a huge land, let's say, 100 acres, 10 acres, this and that. Before I die, I'm going to give it to the temple. There you go. I got my visa. I got this beautiful place in Tavatinsa heaven, <laughs> realm of the 33 gods. Because people have been telling nonsense like this to the public, to the laity, for thousands of years. Money has nothing to do with the Dhamma. But it's not just someone else convincing the public, the laity of that. It has a lot to do with the person driving this thing called life, meaning yourselves. So when you're listening to the sutta, think about your active participation in living your life. Instead of just following a set of rules, a set of traditional steps. Go do this. Did you buy this candle? Did you do this? Did you light this thing? Did you do this chanting? Did I participate? Those are nice, little, little, very tiny, minuscule part of the practice. Very tiny. Very tiny. The rest of it is what well, has a lot to do with you taking it deeper and deeper and deeper and really understanding what it means by anusati, recollecting. So it's very active. You have such a powerful position instead of doing the dana. You could do all those wonderful things, giving the dana, giving away your car, your house, this and that. It doesn't have to be something so big. It could be a cup of water. It could be a smile. Right? Let's not forget the executioner of King Pasenadi, or I think uh, either King Bimisar or King Pasenadi, who had killed so many people as part of his job, decapitating people, heads. But he remembered just one, one, one tiny little thing he had done. He had given his bowl of rice Briyani, delicious type of a rice that his servants had brought him. He offered that to Venerable Sariputta once. That was it. To land him in heaven. <laughs> but how did he do that? He didn't give his way, away his wealth and all that. So your presence mentally with your heart, where is it? How is it? Otherwise, it's just business that you're doing. Okay, if I give this, you know. I've seen people in Asia, you know them better than I do, who go ahead and build miniature houses with paper. Mercedes, BMWs, and all kinds of jets with paper. 
right? Treasure, treasure chests with fake money, and then they put them all together and they burn them so that in the next life they will be greeted with the real thing. Or at least one's loved ones do that for them. Lovely little games. But they don't go beyond that. There's absolutely no evidence that any of that is valid. It's lovely little pastime. But it's good business for the people who are building those paper machete, you know, paper little, you know, toys. So the same thing with the anusati. It, this is a path for mature people, mature thinking people. This is a path not for babies. That's why it's uncomfortable. Sometimes, if you really want to go deep, you have to take responsibility. I mean, you take responsibility for your life, right? When you're working, you are working seriously to get serious money. Why? Because later on you have to pay serious money to your landlord, to the bank, to the insurance company, to the doctor. Serious, actual, not fake money, <laughs> real money, which was made with real effort, not passive effort. Otherwise your bo job, uh, your boss would not pay you. But when it comes to the Dhamma, somehow we think we can fake it. Why? So the recollection that we're going to be covering has everything to do with the same level of seriousness, dedication, active role playing from your part. You cannot sit on the passenger seat of your life. You have to sit on the actual driver's seat of your life. That's what I mean by mature stance. This is not for babies. So, um, this is from the Book of the Sixes, as I mentioned, Sutta number 10, so 6.10 from the Anguttara Nikaya, and it's called the Mahanama Sutta. Mahanama happened to be, uh, there were cousins with Lord Buddha, and he's the brother of Venerable Anuruddha, who happened to be the half-brother also of Venerable Ananda. Uh, <laughs> Mahanama was the one who ended up actually carrying on the royal crown. Everyone else pretty much ended up in robes. One time Venerable Anuruddha, actually before he became Venerable Anuruddha, um, he was walking with Venerable Mahanama, uh, with Mahanama. See, I get confused. So, uh, Venerable Anuruddha, before he became a Venerable, he was still a layman, a prince. Both of them, brothers, walking, and he's like, uh, Mahanama says, either you go or I go. One of us has to go because it's kind of embarrassing. Every single Sakyam family ended up giving one of their sons to the Sangha. And it's embarrassing because Lord Buddha is a Sakyan and we are Sakyan. It's kind of embarrassing. So either you go or I go. And Anuruddha said, well, can we just postpone it? Like, let me just have some more fun? I mean, come on, I have palaces, pleasure, you know. He says, yeah, so he's walking. So Mahanama was a little bit wiser at the time. So they're walking and Anuruddha sees all these patches, you know, the farmlands that they owned, as far as the eye could see. So Mahanama is explaining to his brother, Anuruddha, all the work that needs to be done until they end up with the actual gold pieces and the silver pieces in their treasure tr uh, house and all the tons and tons of grain, which equals money. So he explains that, you know, the first day we have to wait for the soil to get this way, that way, and then we cultivate the land, we have to water it, all we have to prepare the land, the passageway of the wa water, all, all this. So he explains all of that, and Anuruddha is like, okay, yes, okay. Oof, he says, and that's it, right? He says, oh no, we do this next year again, and then again, and then again. That was enough for Anuruddha to give up. He says, you mean to say this is continuous? He says, oh yes, brother. He says, go ahead, you keep the kingly role, 
Do you keep the crown? I will go and wear the robes and be ordained. And he gives up. Now that doesn't mean that Mahanama didn't care about the Dhamma. He practiced it as best as he could as a royal. And he really got deep. I believe he died as a Sotapanna, if not more, at least a Sotapanna. Um, so this is, uh, therefore, uh, a, a dialogue, a discussion where an Mahanama comes over and uh, because he was a king, kings didn't go to different kingdoms necessarily. So whenever you see, for example, a Maharaja like uh, King Pasenadi or Bimbisara or in this case a Mahanama going to see Lord Buddha, usually when Lord Buddha was visiting there kingdom, their region. And it was also honorable, you know, the honorable thing to do. I mean, it's a Buddha, it doesn't happen. So I'm, you know, the king would think, I'm so lucky to have a Buddha in my time period and in my region. Let's go and see him. So here is one such in, uh, instance. At one time, the Blessed One was staying at Nigroda's monastery in the Sakyan capital city of Kapilavatu. There's, today, there's just traces of the palace left in Kapilavatu, the old city. It was during that time that Mahanama the Sakyan approached the Blessed One and after paying homage to him, sat to one side and said to the Blessed One, Bhante, what is usually the position of the heart of the noble disciple who has reached the fruition stage and now comprehends the Tathagata's dispensation? Only a noble disciple can ask a question like this, a sotapanna and up, because he's coming in to check with Lord Buddha to see, am I doing it right, basically? Am I following the necessary correct steps, Bhante? Mahanama, the heart of the noble disciple, who has reached the fruition stage and now comprehends the Tathagata's dispensation is usually positioned in this manner. Here, Mahanama, the noble disciple recollects the Buddha thus. The Blessed One is an Arahant, perfectly awakened, endowed with sublime knowledge and supremely pure conduct. The well gone, the knower of worlds, the incomparable, tamer of those to be tamed, the teacher of gods and humans, enlightened and blessed. You might have heard it often, Itipiso Bhagava Arahan. That's the one that he says in the in the Pali, we get the whole thing. We don't that was basically spoken by Lord Buddha. When you're repeating it, reciting it, it's coming straight from the lips of Lord Buddha. So be mindful of that whenever you say it. It's beautiful. You know that no one messed with it. <laughs> and whenever Mahanama, the noble disciple, recollects the Tathagata in this manner, his heart is no longer caught within the clutches of lust, hatred, or delusion. In meaning, the three defilements, the kileshas, are not present. Meaning, if the person, the noble disciple, is whether they're bowing, whether they're Actually, in Anjali, whether they're standing in front of a statue of a Buddha, in front of a stupa, in front of a temple, or in the middle of the subway, holding one of the handles, you know, standing up in rush hour, the mind, the heart is in the right place and they're reciting this in their heart. It doesn't. The outside circumstances do not matter. The kileshas aren't there in one's heart. Lust, hatred, delusion are not there. There's only room enough for the Buddha. That's Buddhanus Sati. You cannot be thinking, I can't wait, get, wait to get home and send this nasty email to this to my boss or to my this or that. Yeah, yeah, ITP so yeah, yeah, Bhagavato Arahato Sama. No, you're fully there. There's no room for something else. Completely. There's no kinesia in the heart. There's no, none of the three poisons. His mind is naturally pointed straight towards the Tathagata. 
And such a noble disciple whose heart is resolute and unwavering, unshaking, soon realizes the meanings directly, becoming inspired by the Dhamma, uh, by the Buddha, and experiences, uh, no, excuse me, becoming inspired by the Dhamma and experiences for himself the joy that understanding the Dhamma brings to him. Remember, why the Dhamma? We were talking about the Buddha. Because Lord Buddha was always a realist. He knew he was not going to live forever. He was going to die. And that's why we see him again and again mentioning how we need to look at the Dhamma, the teaching, not worship Lord Buddha. It's the teaching. And we don't even worship the teaching. We must practice and understand the teaching. That's where the mind becomes focused on the teaching. And even your breathing, your walking becomes so graceful. Your eating becomes graceful because you live with the Dhamma. You don't even have to say iti piso anymore. You are it. You are it. And when the mind is glad, the body becomes relaxed. Ooh, this is very nice. That's why I encourage you, before you sit, check to see if you're scanning the body and seeing if there's any tension and you're relaxing, loosening those areas. You cannot have liberation of the mind if the body is tight, if it is experiencing tension. It's impossible. I don't care who says what. That's why you cannot sit there, study Abhidhamma or Visuddhimagga and be in this painful, frowny face and somehow experience even a jhana. Even a jhana, measly jhana, let alone sotapatti or arahanshya. It's impossible. Your body has to feel relaxed. Not so relaxed that you fall asleep. Let's be logical, <laughs> right? <laughs> You have experience with that. <laughs> so, and because of the relaxation within the body, he experiences happiness. I remember when I would spend time uh, with uh, Bhante Punnaji years ago. He and I would, would, would say these, these statements together and it was so lovely. And, Piti uh, manasakayang pasambati. Pasadhakayo sukham vediyati. Sukhino chittam sukham vediyati. Samahite chitte sukham patu, uh, dhammam patu patu bhavo. When the body is so relaxed, the dhamma appears. Oh. The body is so important, we forget. We forget. It's not a fight. Siddhartha was fighting for six plus years. Why are we fighting with the body? It's not a fight, a quarrel. We must celebrate the body in the sense that give it what it needs, give it that relaxation. Don't carry this knot in your gut. So many people have ulcers. So many people push the body, punish in their own retreats. I have to sit in the full lotus. Why? No one's going to give you a prize, a cookie. Sit comfortably somewhere, enough so you don't fall asleep. I encourage even students on long retreats to go ahead and put, if their back hurts, the sacrum or any of the sciatica, all these things could be issues. Find yourself a nice wall, secure yourself. I've had students with trauma, PTSD. Well, a person with PTSD needs to have some back support. They need to, because if they sit without back support, it feels like somebody's going to come and attack them from the back. It's subconscious, they don't even think about this. I did the research on this, and then that's what also other researchers in trauma have discovered. If the low back, if the back is supported, suddenly the mind becomes much more relaxed, quicker. There's safety in the mind that, okay, my back is safe. I'm okay, I'm secure. Plus there's the physical pain. Why do I need to have the student torture themselves? What benefit does that bring? Go ahead and sit against the wall. 
make it comfortable. Put a pillow, make it comfortable, but not too comfortable where you fall asleep and start snoring. <laughs> There's no panya there. <laughs> okay. And for the noble disciple experiencing such happiness, the mind becomes naturally collected. Samadhi, samadhi. This Mahanama is called the noble disciple who lives in harmony amidst a world that is in disharmony. Disharmony, going against it, remember? Against the current. He dwells untroubled among the troubled population, even if you live among crazy people. The eight billion waiting outside. Unafflicted and unstained, and having entered the stream of the Dhamma, he maintains the recollection of the Buddha. Again, Mahanama, the noble disciple recollects the Dhamma thus. The Dhamma of the Blessed One is well expounded. It is directly visible here and now, or immediately effective, inviting inspection, leading inwards, and to be applied and personally realized by the wise for themselves. That was Svakato Bhagavata Dhammo Sanditiko. Directly visible. By whom? By you, the person sitting on the cushion. No one else. Don't wait for the other person, the monk or somebody or groups of monks to, to chant it and they are living it type of a thing. That's absolutely illogical, unreal. Not true, often. If you want to taste it, you taste it in yourself. That's it. And whenever Mahanama, the noble disciple, recollects the Dhamma in this manner, his heart is no longer caught within the clutches of hate, lust, hatred, and delusion. So we repeat that formula uh, about the relaxation of the body. Uh, whose heart is resolute and unwavering, soon realizes the meanings directly, becoming inspired by the Dhamma, and experiences for himself the joy that understanding the Dhamma brings to him. That's why you must listen. You must listen with your heart, not to the person speaking. Because you might like the speaker, you might not. It has nothing to do with the speaker. Close your eyes, allow the words of the Dhamma penetrate your heart. Sometimes I've seen people uh, take a notebook, notepad, something, and they start writing every single thing, taking notes. I used to do that in retreats and things. But that is the quickest way to miss. And sometimes like, yeah, he just said something very nice, but what was it? Because I was too busy writing this. So you're always playing catch up and guess what? You're missing out too much left brain activity, too much. In fact, earlier there was a gentleman here while we were sitting. I asked them gently, nicely to please put the notebook down. They were taking notes while we were taking, meditating. During meditation, we meditate. We don't do anything else. This is not a academic, you know, forum or some type of a, you know, auditorium where we're taking notes and this, relax, do some work, stop being lazy. We think we're doing something. No, oh, we're being lazy because we're not doing the most important work. And when the mind is glad, the body becomes relaxed. And because of the relaxation within the body, he experiences happiness. Sometimes I get students who come and say, Bhante, I was feeling this, much, this joy and happiness. Is it wrong? Is it wrong? No, why, why would happiness be wrong? Remember the fight that Siddhartha had to go through? Rejection of anything that gives you even remotely some sense of soothing happiness? That is completely wrong view. Indulgence in pleasures, that's a different story altogether, yes. So happiness is necessary, in fact. It's a necessary quality. If you do not have joy and happiness in your heart, it's impossible for the Dhamma to enter it. You're inviting guests into your home, but your house is dirty, full of trash. 
Would you go into anyone's house if it's dirty? You would walk out and say, like, thank you for the invite, but no thanks, I'm out. The same thing, we need to be happy first. Uh, please don't cross your leg. Um, this Mahanama is called the noble disciple who lives in harmony amidst a world that is in disharmony. So this is a repetition of the recollection Anusati that we saw with the Buddha Anusati. Now it's the Dhamma Anusati. Now we get to the third one, as you guessed it, it's about the Sangha. Again, Mahanama, the noble disciple recollects the noble Sangha thus. The disciples of the Blessed One are practicing all well the good way, which is the threefold training of Sila, Samadhi, Panya. Usually you don't see this in the English translation. It's very brief, it's, it's like taking it for granted that the person should understand. Many of us, when we recite, in this case, Supatiponno, uh, Bhagavato, Savaka, Sangha, all these things, we don't know what they're saying, other than very rough terms. But they are tiny little umbrella terms, which have underneath them deeper meanings, which need to be unraveled, opened up, unpackaged. Loosened up, loosened up, unpacked, which is why I had to translate it in this way. So um, I'll say it again from the start. The disciples of the Blessed One are practicing well the good way, which is the threefold training of sila, samadhi, panya, morality, mental cultivation, and wisdom. The disciples of the Blessed One are practicing the straight path of the threefold training, which is the middle path. The disciples of the Blessed One are practicing wisely to realize Nibbana in a methodical way. The disciples of the Blessed One are practicing the Dhamma in harmony. Such are the four pairs of eight great beings, comprising the eight noble disciples of the Blessed One, the ones to be honored and respected, deserving of hospitality, worthy of offerings, to be venerated with reverential salutation with one's palms, pressed together at the heart, the incomparable field of merit for the world. And whenever Mahanama, the noble disciple, recollects the noble Sangha of the Blessed One in this manner, his heart is no longer caught within the clutches of lust, hatred, and, or delusion. You put yourself in a special space and time. In fact, time doesn't exist anymore. You created sacredness in your heart. And wherever you are with that kind of sacredness in your heart, it is sacred. Everywhere you go. You could be standing in the worst part of the universe, ugliest place, dirtiest place, but with your heart being in such a sacred space, it is sacred. That's it. I always, whenever I would, you know, um, years ago, uh, well, as a layman, when I would wash dishes, my dishes, it would be greasy or something. And then when you have water around it and you have the grease, and then I would add the detergent, dishwashing detergent, and it would drop. Suddenly the oil around pushes away, cleanses it. That detergent, call it bleach or whatever it is, it pushed everything aside. It created innocent sacredness, cleanliness. It forced itself. That's what we're seeing here. You need to sit on a chair because you're really struggling. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, get something like like. Yeah, we can chair. Yeah, that that you could turn off, probably. Yeah. Mm, yeah, we don't need that many. Um, so, and when the mind is glad, the body becomes relaxed. And because of the relax, so we see the same mechanism. So it's not just Dhammanus Sati, Sanghanus Sati, saying these words like an automaton, like a, like a repeat, like, yeah, like a mantra, which is what we have turned it into often. It's more than that. You're checking your body constantly. In, are the words I'm saying really untying the knots, untying my, the pressures in my shoulder, my gut, 
is my body being affected by these words? And if they're not, maybe, maybe, maybe I'm just faking it. Maybe I'm just going with routine. I'm not living it, basically. This Mahanama is called the noble disciple who lives in harmony amidst the world that is in disharmony. He dwells untroubled among the troubled population, unafflicted and unstained. And having entered the stream of Dhamma, he maintains the recollection excuse me, of the noble Sangha. This is not a passive affair. I keep repeating it. We breathe all the time. We breathe so many thousands of times a day. We do it passively. But when you do anapanasati, you're forcing yourself to come out of that autopilot. Suddenly you take ownership of your awareness and you start taking ownership of your breathing. As you do that, you're no longer playing a passive role. There was a, a Japanese uh, uh, tea ceremony master. I think I might have mentioned it some time ago to some people. And um, I think in Japanese it's called Chado. And uh, he was known as the greatest in Japan the greatest master of tea ceremony. Whenever you see the word Do at the end, it's like, it's the art form of it, the most highest form of it. There's Kendo, there's Yaido, there's even in Ikebana, the flower arrangement, they have masters. So he has many students apparently, the tea ceremony master. And uh, they start an argument with the students of another master, and that master happens to be a Kenjutsu, uh, which is a swordsmanship. So that group of students basically were the students of a master who was an expert swordsman. So they're competing as to which art is the better one. So they say something, and it goes back and forth, and uh, the sword master hears about it and calls out the tea ceremony master to a duel. He says, we are going to settle this and you're going to fight for your life. Tomorrow morning, bring your sword and we will settle this. One master to the next as to who is the best. There's no contest, as you can tell, because one of them is just makes tea, green tea, delicious probably, but just makes tea. The other one kills people and is a master at doing that. So he's terrified, he's like, I'm dead for sure, I'm dead. I only have a few hours. So he's asking around and finally someone says, master, there is this old, old sword master living in the mountains. You, he, he's the only one who can help you, but he says, how can I learn this mastery of swordsmanship within a few hours? But anyhow, he doesn't have any choice. So he has the, musters the courage to go and he goes to this tiny little kuti of this master. He walks in and he's terrified, shaking. And he explains the situation and the old man, old master says, it's okay, it's okay, calm down, calm down. You say you're a tea master, yes? He says, yes. He says, okay, could you make me tea? And he says, of course I can, but do you think that's, he says, please make me tea. The way you know how. The way you know how. And this tea ceremony master suddenly becomes a totally different person. That's his world. He is a master. He's a Roshi at that. He's, he's a top level master at this. And the way he holds he, the, the tea, the, the, he pulls out the spoonful of it, the way he puts it inside the bowl, the way he stirs it. Every tiniest little gesture is drenched in sati. Nothing matters. The universe stops around him. It becomes a sacred space. And then he pours the tea to the old teacher and pours some for himself. 
And the teacher, the old teacher looks at him, smiles and says, make sure you take this with you. Whatever you're doing, he says, it's enough. It's enough. Take this awareness, level of perfection in your sati with you tomorrow. And don't you be afraid. Go and meet this arrogant other teacher. Don't be afraid. And he says, by the way, here's my sword. And he says, are you sure? He says, just do whatever you did now, but with the sword. He says, oh, I can do that. So he goes the next day, early morning, to meet his opponent. And the opponent sees him come and he's like, I have this, I'm going to kill him. There's no way that the tea ceremony fellow is going to beat me. But the moment he walks into that circle, the tea ceremony master, with the sword, something is different. Something is very different. And the sword master notices and he stops. This is not the same fluttering, weak looking, afraid person anymore. Something's different. He's sharp. His sati is like a diamond, impenetrable. And if you've ever done any martial arts, you're always looking for that penetrating moment, that opening. The moment you find that opening, you have already vanquished your opponent. But if you cannot find that opening, you don't walk in because you know, if you walk in, you have opened yourself up and you are defeated before you even draw your sword. And he looks and he looks and he sees his opponent so still, so aware, so fully present and he bows and he takes a step back and he says, it's a draw. I respect you. The duel is over. Sati. Sati. But you have to be actively there when you're doing generosity, which we'll come over right now to. Dana, it's not a passive affair. Even the way you prepare something, if you're going to pour some water, some tea, uh, if you, even something mundane, when you get the, let's say, red envelope or something you put inside, the way you fold it, the way you hold it, where you place it, how you hand it, as if it's the very last act in this life that you will be committing. Don't make it mundane. It's like your life depends on it. Don't make it sloppy. In America, we call it sloppy. It's like, yeah, it's like, no. It's like your life depends on it. It's like my, my uh, sometimes I would see individuals or like my nephews or someone close would come sometimes with like a hair caught inside their eye on the cornea, so something blue or something. And the way you touch it, the way you have to get out, like the tiny little hair from the eye, you have to be exquisitely precise, soft, relaxed, so that you can get that thing out of the eye. You're very present, that's sati. That's sati. So, uh, so the Dhamma is always pushing us outside our comfort zone. Because we're lazy. And that's why we're recollecting here. To pull ourselves out. Now we get into outside the triple gem. And we get more personal. Again, Mahanama, the noble disciple, recollects his own virtues that are continuously kept. Unbroken, flawless stainless and liberating from his old negative patterns of behavior. It's not, it's no longer at this level of functioning for a noble disciple, it is no longer just, oh, let me not break the five precepts. It's no longer that, it's deeper than that. It's like life depends on it. It's serious business. And you're not doing it because somebody, you don't want somebody to catch you doing it. You have to answer to yourself. That's the level of commitment. 
you cannot relax. You wake up in the middle of the night, your mind is so sharp, you're waiting, you're waiting, you're observing. If there's any kind of agitation in the mind, if there's any desire for something that could be termed as breaking of sila, you're so sharply waiting and watching like a very strong, alert dog, guard dog, you're waiting. Or a lion that's about to pounce is prey. So alert, like a mother jaguar or a, or a cheetah, the fastest running four-legged animal in the world. And the cheetah has three or four cubs to feed and they have not eaten for three weeks. So she has to be very careful not to miss this opportunity. That's how alert we have to be. And approaching Sila from that angle makes it, takes it to a totally different level. It's no longer like, oh, I hope I'm not going to break a five, five Sila, punch a Sila. I hope I'm not breaking. You're beyond that. This is not a baby's work. This is a mature person's effort that's always going on. Because you have to answer to yourself. So you're observing the fact that you're that virtuous. Even when life is so difficult for you, and you think that the doors are closing on you, your world is collapsing, all you have to do is think about the virtues that you have in your heart. You say to yourself, when was the last time I broke that precept? When was the last time I actually took something from someone without them knowing? When was the last time that I intentionally hurt someone? And then for such a person, they really have to struggle to remember such a thing. But you don't have to get to that level to know. You can do it now. So f when you forget to be grateful, be grateful for the fact that you are living a virtuous life. Appreciate that. Even though you don't have that much money in the bank account, for example, that you want, but at least you're virtuous. No matter what happens, if somebody comes, you see somebody uh, dropping money, you see them, money falling out of their pocket. Large amount of money, but they're not aware. Do you wait for them to go <laughs> and then you pick it up? Or you quickly say, excuse me, uh, there's, there, your wallet is out there in the open. Somebody's going to take it. Or you just drop this. You just drop this. That takes a special kind of virtue. You're not doing it because there are cameras around watching you. So, or you want to be on the news. Oh, look at this person. They gave $100,000 that they found back to the owner. You're not looking for that kind of accolade or acknowledgement. You're doing this for you. That is virtue. That means you don't have this business mentality. Tit for tat, I do this, you do that. No, you're doing this for yourself. That is virtue. That is special. That is so unique. The Queen of England cannot do that. Probably the Pope cannot do that. Somebody who walks around in robes cannot do that. Probably. But if you can, that immediately makes you part of a special minority. That is why we call them noble. The people that people, you know, United Nations and other countries call them noble. The king of so-and-so, the royal, royal highness so-and-so. They're not royal highness at all, as far as the Dhamma is concerned. In order for them to be noble, they must be better than you. Better. In your sila. I've even seen uh, Buddhist monks, Theravada monks, bowing to the Queen of England, which is a no-no. A Buddhist monk never bows to anyone in that capacity. You bow down to someone superior, especially in the case of superior in the sense of Arya, Arya, noble. Why though noble? Because the nobility comes from one's own virtue in the heart. 
I doubt that the king or queen of this or that country, not in this country, or anywhere, could actually, when the opportunity presents itself, they will not lie. Politicians lie all the time. So where's the nobility in that? I know many, many, many students who will not lie. They will have this fight in themselves. That is nobility. Acknowledge it. That's what we have to recollect. That's anusati, sila, the higher level of sila, especially as you work on this, it becomes adisila. Adisila, which is no longer just for pretenses. I keep my sila, yes, I, I, I keep my sila, especially on Uposha today, so I, I keep my eight precepts. Yeah, but what do you do after that? When no one's looking, actually. Why every two weeks? Why not always? Why not always? Uh, and whenever Mahanama, the noble disciple, recollects his own virtuous behavior in this manner, his heart is no longer caught within the clutches of lust, hatred, and delusion. Because you cut yourself off from the world when you remind yourself of the virtue. Your virtue, no one else's. You can think of other people. If, if it's, your mind is very cloudy, it's okay. If you know someone who is, you consider someone who's very deserving of your respect and you know them to be virtuous and at that moment, for some reason, your mind is very tumultuous, agitated. You cannot think about your virtue, think of theirs, that's okay. Think of your spiritual friend that you use for your metta practice. That's why you chose them, <laughs> usually. So, um, this Mahanama is called the noble disciple who lives in harmony amidst a world that is in disharmony. He dwells untroubled among the troubled population, unafflicted and unstained. And having entered the stream of the Dhamma, he maintains the recollection of his virtues. Last week I was reminded by one of you that Bhante, during all that time, you did not drink water. So I'm going to drink some water. <laughs> because I, I feel it's like, come on, you're interrupting the flow of Dhamma. It's not fair for the Dhamma. But hey, I have a throat. Possibly I'll do a better job, a better voice. Okay, number five. Again, Mahanama, the noble disciple, recollects his generosity while reflecting. It is truly a great gain for me that despite being surrounded by a world that is obsessed by stinginess, I, on the other hand, live with generosity in my heart. Having given up the stains of miserliness, I live while being freely generous, enjoying the giving up of things while being open-handed in my dedication to charity and providing resources to those in need, sharing with them whatever it is of value that I possess. It must have value, whatever it is that you want to give away. It must have value especially to you. At that moment, at that moment, it means your goals are no longer that important at that moment. Now, yes, of course, it could be financial because whenever we think about generosity, immediately the human brain goes to finances, money, objects, material things. Okay. That's part of it, because we have to live in a material world. Yes, okay, fine, but can you be generous when someone is in pain? And you are also in pain. Your boyfriend or husband or somebody left you. So you have all the reasons in the world to be upset, angry, blaming people basically saying to everyone around you, pay attention to me. I need you, world, to pay attention to me for a change, okay? Because I am in ruins. I'm lost. 
I lost everything. Meanwhile, you see this other person coming in next to you, and you realize without the shadow of a doubt that they are also in a very bad state. Your mind is going to say, yeah, but there's no way that her situation could compare to mine. So mine is worse. So she should pay attention to me. Why should I actually start, you know, becoming compassionate or empathic, listening to her, listening to her? That listening is the act of generosity at that moment. And listening truthfully, this, is, this means that you are making space. You're giving up. At this point, you're giving up your infatuation, your attachment to my pain and saying, let me be there for another human being. And let me put the contrasting, conceited mind outside for a change and just be here for her, for him. This is something that human beings during these last, especially last three years, two and a half years have forgotten. It's not being promoted. We have become especially selfish, especially, and I've seen this across the globe. I've seen this in families against each other. No, 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 my problems are more important than yours type of a thinking. And we have all kinds of reasonings for that. Where is generosity in that? So you see, I'm not talking about money, material. I'm talking about you becoming available for another human being. I've also noticed this in when you are in a responsible position, when you have access to certain things that other beings don't. When I was a high school teacher and department chair of uh, this K through 12 school, and I would have, you know, I would teach biology, I would teach other sciences, and then the students would apply to different universities and colleges. Now, sometimes I would get students who were not straight A students, or they weren't like excellent academically, but I had seen how they were trying so hard, they developed. I've seen them as they were even like fifth or sixth graders, and now they're in 12th grade, they're about to go into the world, they're really excited, and I have suddenly a power that I could exercise to make their dreams come true. And I would see some other teachers who would bend over backwards or try to pull strings or say, no, I'm not going to give you this letter of recommendation. But the moment they would come to me, I'm like, I can't believe this. The universe gave me this very prestigious or privileged position, I, I think I like to call it, where one letter, how much time is it going to take me? You know, maybe 20 minutes to write a letter. And I know the person. I don't have to ask anyone. I know them in their citizenship, in their behavior. I pushed their buttons over the years. I've disciplined them. And I've seen their development academically. I have all the cards. So who else is going to write? And why shouldn't I? So over the years, I would write these recommendations letter, letters like hotcakes. I would just give it to them. And then I would just wait like them. Like, you know, I can't wait for them to get this news from UCLA or wherever, you, you know, Berkeley or something. And they would come back. They're jumping up and down. What was that? How much did that take from me? I didn't get paid for that. It was my time, it was my lunch time actually, which I don't get paid for, you know. But another human being now has parts of their goals checked because you did something for them. Isn't that generosity? So there's, I need you to think outside the box. Don't just think in terms of, because I'm, I'm surprised sometimes I hear People, lay people, especially when they come and they say, Bhante, whenever I go to the temple, I'm kind of sick of it because they keep tell, talking about Sila and Donna, Sila and Donna, Donna and Sila, Donna and Sila. Donna, usually. Generosity and Prisa. That's not the Dhamma, you know? There's more stuff to it than that. 
And that's why many, many people are leaving temples, churches, and other religious institutions around the world because they feel disconnected. So we have to really connect back to life. And that's what the Dhamma is for. That's why we respect the Dhamma. And whenever Mahanama, the noble disciple, recollects his generosity in this manner, his heart is no longer caught within the clutches of lust, hatred, and delusion. Instead, his mind is naturally pointed straight towards being generous in any way. In any way. Uh, and then it goes, whoever is like this, their heart just becomes happy, just like in the other segments. This Mahanama is called the noble disciple who lives in harmony amidst a world that is in disharmony. He dwells untroubled among the troubled population, unafflicted and unstained. And having entered the stream of the Dhamma, excuse me, he maintains the recollection of his generosity. Again, Mahanama, the noble, this is the number, the number six. The noble disciple recollects the devas, which for some reason, for some people, some Buddhist circles, is a taboo. People don't like to talk about devas, especially in, even here. In Asia, I, I, I was joking the other day, factually, that there's a lot of people here in Asia who believe in spirits, hungry ghosts, evil spirits, then devas. Oh, Bhante, are they are there spirits? Are there this? Are there that? And again, petas. This and we celebrated a few days ago. You know, okay. What happened to the devas? Nobody talks about the devas. Where where they go? They're here still, you know. In fact, there are more devas than all the evil spirits that you can conjure up in your mind, that you've been told about by your parents who've tried to scare you, <laughs> or your culture. The devas are far greater in number, more powerful. More powerful than you could possibly imagine. And they're beautiful. And they love the Dhamma, many of them do. So you recollect the devas. Think about the devas because we are so lost. We have put ourselves in this shipping container we call my life, my material life. And it's sealed shut with concrete until the moment of death. That's when we kind of get weaker in the knees and we say, oh, okay, I hope there's another life. I hope there's another heaven. But throughout your life, imagine if you could always remember the devas while you're alive. You go to a park, you go, you listen to a Dhamma talk. There's always some devas around during Dhamma talks. Always. I don't recall a time when I've never felt them. At least a few. You're alive. They're alive in their way. Why do you shun that? Why do you shut that out of your life? Saying, well, it doesn't fit into my paradigm. No, it, it should be. Do you see all the ants that are in this building? Do you see all the bugs that are inside you in your intestines? The billions and billions and billions of tiny little gut organisms. Do you see them? They're doing a lot of work, you know. They're helping your gut to digest the food. You never send them a happy thank you card. You never celebrate them. You never say thank you. But they're there. The devas are there too. You don't see them. That doesn't mean they don't exist. Your friends exist, but you don't see them now. They're outside. But they're alive, similarly. There are devas reborn in the company of the four great kings. Devas in the company of the 33 gods. There are also the Yama Devas, the Devas, of the, the Devas in the Tushita heaven. Devas who delight in their own creations and Devas who delight in controlling the creation of others, other Devas. There are the Devas who are in the Brahma's company and still above these realms, many more sublime Devas are to be found. Just like these Devas in their own individual pasts possessed the strong faith virtuous behavior, learning, generosity, and wisdom. And thus, at the end of their lives, while disappearing from here, they immediately reappeared there in those divine destinations. 
I too, this is the person who's reflecting, I too now possess in my heart the same level of faith. You're a human being. You're saying this to yourself. Now, just like those devas that used to be human that are now devas after they died, but because they, like you now, have sila or faith, in this case, uh, sadha, faith, you have sila, they had it too. Same level of learning, generosity, and wisdom, when the time came for them to die, they disappeared here, they died here after the end of the body, they reappeared there immediately. These do exist, you know. These are not hearsay, these are not folk tales. You practice, you will know this. I didn't believe in devas. I didn't well, I don't believe in any of these things that people say, I have believe in this, in that. And for years, for over two, two and a half decades or two decades, I used to read these things and I would just, because I have a background in science. I'm like, okay, thank, I respect the Dhamma, the Buddha, the Sangha. I was like, okay, this is too big of a pill for me to swallow. I'll just skip it. I'll skip it. And if somebody would ask me, I'll say, I don't know. And, you know, last week we talked about Kalama Sutta, right? Was it last week or the week before? Week, two weeks ago, yes. So in it, you also are encouraged to think. But that doesn't mean that simply because it's not your experience, it doesn't exist. Many people misunderstand Kalama Sutta. Because of that, I spent so many hours explaining it to you how it is misquoted and misrepresented, the sutta. So I encourage people now to keep practicing until you actually taste it, to taste the existence of the devas. You know it for yourself, and then you don't need to believe anything. One time a person came and asked uh, Lord Buddha, uh, because uh, he was he was of a different faith. And he came, in a sense, to challenge the Buddha, in a sense, in a very diplomatic way. In those days, people were, were a lot more respectful, you know, often. And um, so they were talking about belief. And he says, uh, belief, belief. And uh, at that moment, Venerable Sariputta was sitting right next to Lord Buddha. And Venerable Sariputta was the general of the Dhamma second in wisdom to Lord Buddha. So you listen when Venerable Sariputta spoke. It's like Lord Buddha in his absence. So he says, you know, for example, your relationship here, your students, there has to be belief. And Lord Buddha doesn't skip a beat. He turns to Venerable Sariputta and says, Sariputta, do you believe in me? And Sariputta, Venerable Sariputta doesn't skip a beat either. And he says, Oh no, Bhagavan. Oh no, Bhante. I don't believe in you. The man is now truly perplexed. His jaw drops. He's like, are you kidding me? You have this much devotion to your teacher, and you're saying that you don't believe in Buddha. How does this work? He's scratching his head and he says, I don't have to believe in you, Bhante. I have tasted the Dhamma. I go by my own experience of the Dhamma. Nothing in the Dhamma is taken simply by on faith for him. He had tasted every single dot and period and comma and anything you can imagine. He had tasted it, tested it and experience it for himself. And that's where he was coming from. That's why we say, he, to be realized by the wise, for themselves, for themselves, including the devas. Instead of saying, well, uh, they don't exist. Keep the door open. Keep the windows open. <laughs> Keep practicing, go deep. And you will see whether they exist or not. You don't have to believe anyone. Not Lord Buddha, let alone me. 
Um, so, um, just like, uh, so basically, um, what this is saying is, it's not just anusati, you need to have certain qualities during the recollection. Pancha Indriya. The five spiritual faculties have to be there every time you recollect, even if it's just one of them. Buddha Anusati, for example. Buddha, Buddha, Buddha. You need to have the five. Sadha, right? Remember? What else comes? Pancha Indriya. You remember? Sadha. Sati, you have virya, you have samadhi, you have panya. You need these five. If there's no panya, then it's a cult. Then it's a rites and ritual, plain and simple. You can call it Buddhist, but it is still a cult. A bigger one, but still. You must have panya. This path is based on wisdom, period. Not based on tradition, hearsay, repetition, how charming the teacher is. I've talked about this millions of, well, lots of times, especially here. You know, I don't have to repeat myself. This path is based on discerning wisdom of you, your wisdom. No need to believe anybody. And whenever Mahanama, the noble disciple, recollects the devas in this manner, his heart is no longer caught within the clutches of lust, hatred, and delusion. Instead, it is naturally pointed towards the devas. And such a noble disciple, whose heart is resolute and unwavering, soon realizes the meaning directly, becoming inspired by the Dhamma and experiences for himself the joy that understanding the Dhamma brings to him. And for the one who becomes thus joyful, there is gladness in the mind. And when the mind is glad, the body becomes relaxed. And because of the relaxation within the body, he experiences happiness. And for the noble disciple experiencing such happiness, the mind becomes naturally collected. This Mahanama is collected, the no, uh, called the noble disciple who lives in harmony amidst a world that is in disharmony. And our world is in very much disharmony. He dwells untroubled among the troubled population, unafflicted and unstained. And having entered the stream of the Dhamma, he maintains the recollection of the, de of the Devas. So in those difficult times, you must, especially even if you are unable to get into a jhana, even if you're unable to practice the tranquility of mind, for some reason, sometimes the sickness is so bad. Sometimes you are in the hospital, let's say. You're in anesthesia or half awake, half, as, half asleep. It's very difficult for you to go into samadhi. But you can still think of your virtues or at the very least think of the devas. Once when chitta, you know, we talked about a few suttas of chitta, the householder. Uh, there's a wonderful uh, sutta in the Sangyutta Nikaya when he's about to die. And he, he was this very, very wealthy man and his children and grandchildren were around him. And at that moment, they see him, their father, their grandfather, in bed, talking, conversing. And they say, oh, dad has lost it. Grandpa has lost it. You know, he's just, you know, no longer coherent. And he says, you guys don't know what you're talking about to his children and grandchildren. And they said, but you're talking to yourself. He says, oh no, I'm not talking to myself. I was talking all right, but I wasn't talking to myself. And they're confused. And he says, there are many devas now here in this room and some of them who don't know the Dhamma very well, or at least are not of my stage, because he was an Anadam, not realizing where I am in my path on the, in the Dhamma, they're begging me to desire to have the notion of becoming a Chakavattin, a wheel-turning universal monarch, a king, a Buddhist king, which is which is almost like, in its rarity, it's almost like a Buddha appearing in the universe. That's how rare it is. So they're saying, please make that aspiration because you have enough merits 
enough punya, enough purity in your heart that you definitely will become a chakravatin if you wish. But he says, they don't realize that my mind has already given up all sensuality, meaning he had overcome the five lower fetters, meaning he would immediately reappear in the pure abodes, because he was an anagami, to become an arahant there, if he didn't become an arahant on the way there. <laughs> so he says, I was trying to teach them Dhamma, the Devas, to let go of their own attachment to this idea of more pleasure. So he was teaching even on his deathbed. He was teaching not just humans, he was teaching devas. And that's another thing. Not all devas are really advanced in the, in the Dhamma. There are many, many who are but there are also many who are not. So they are also watching and observing you. If you practice sila one day and you don't practice the next day, they're kind of disappointed. They might have actually been inspired by how you did dana or how you lived with sila for one day or one year or 10 years. But then it's like a very good friend who is inspired by you, but one day they see you go and do something out of character. That's very disappointing. They'll say, I can't be your friend anymore. And they just walk away. The devas are like that too. They're like people. So be careful because the devas are also watching you. <laughs> so be in your best behavior. Not because they would do something. No. It's like a very dear friend. You don't want to disappoint them. And you might even inspire them to become even better Buddhist. <laughs> better practitioner. Mahanama, this is the manner in which the heart of the noble disciple who has reached the fruition stage and now comprehends the Tathagata's dispensation is usually positioned. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. So I hope you liked this sutta. It's a different sutta discourse. And I... Uh, I'm open for any questions you might have, comments, as long as it has to do with the practice with the Dhamma. Bhante, mm. uh, with regard to the Sangha in the Anusati, mm. uh, what was actually the purpose of the Buddha forming a Sangha? The, the question here relates to two, two points. Mm. One is in terms of the four verses which you read just now and elaborated. Uh, that actually gave a semblance on what the Sangha is for. But i like to highlight the Diga Nigaya, in which the final words of the Buddha, he tells everyone to actually put their trust in their own capacity, in terms of using the Dhamma and the Vinaya, as the guide. So how do you see the Sangha's prominence and power and authority in the whole context of Buddhism? Ah, that's a can of worms, we say, in America. I've addressed it in different ways. Almost in every single talk, I've addressed it. Wrong view is everywhere, simply because we are on the surface practicing what can be seen as the Dhamma, reading the text, listening to talks on in the Pali suttas out of all suttas, which you know are the most authentic doctrinal suttas. But there's always, sadly, room for wrong view. That's the human condition. I remember one of my oldest teachers, earliest teachers, he was a Mahatera. He was in his 80s, almost 80s at the time, actually, late 70s. And I said, Bhante, I was close enough to him. I had been with him and I was his kapi, I was his, you know, around him. And I would spend at least five days there. Uh, he was the first one who said, I need you to become a bhikkhu. And my father said, no. 
Anyhow, he would uh, not practice meditation. And you would say something about the suttas and he would go off and start reciting entire paragraphs in Pali. So I had a dilemma. I was like, Bhante, you don't practice. So I knew he wouldn't get offended because he knew that I was kind of weird. I was very spontaneous. He kind of expected that from me. Obviously, I said it in private, out of respect, of course. But I said, can I say something, Bhante? And, and he said, yeah, sure, go ahead. And I said, I've never seen you practice, Bhante. I'm sorry to say that, but I've never seen you. Do you practice? Maybe I don't see you practicing. Maybe it's my fault. I, I don't, you know. He says, no, I don't practice. But I said, how is the Dhamma going to help you? He said, well, and he said this with some sense of confidence, belief rather, that as bhikkhus who know this many suttas, uh, when we die, we will go to a heavenly realm. Of course, I was in no way where, you know, I would say to myself, I was an expert. But I knew something was wrong in that statement. And this was coming from a person who's an actual, bona fide, 100%, Mahanayaka. You can't get higher than that, okay? In robes, you know, mundane level speaking. So what to do in answer to your question? The Sangha, the way I understand it, is the noble Sangha, which I understand also as the Maha Sangha. Unfortunately, when you go to a Dana ceremony, any temple, when they talk about Maha Sangha, they're talking about the collection of actual bhikkhus sitting there. They call it Maha Sangha. Wrong! That is not the Maha Sangha. Maha Sangha is the Arya Sangha. That means the eight category of noble disciples. That, whether in robes or not. This is what makes very... That's why you don't, you rarely see monks being present when I give Dhamma talks. It makes people uncomfortable, let's be honest. Maha Sangha, lay people, how is that possible? That goes against every traditional value we have. People will say that. Well, that's what you just mentioned in the Mahaparinibbana Sutta, the biggest sutta. Lord Buddha is urging us, urging us. Ur That's what he was doing for 45 years. Urging us. You don't have to be in robes to be practicing the Dhamma. Majority of the people were not in robes. Chitta, I just gave him. There are so many suttas on him. Three times I mentioned him. He was a lay person. And he would teach the so-called traditional Sangha. So that is where I find the error. Now, that also does not, should not give free license to people to go ahead, like in the West, or some Mahayana traditions, if not most in Vajrayana, where they go ahead and anybody, a lay person, and their own monastics and priests become the Sangha. That's also wrong. So it's like ba uh, throwing the baby with the bathwater. There's an English saying. That also, because that's an extreme, going to the other extreme. So when we say Sangha, we're talking about the noble Sangha. Of course, there, I had one teacher who said there's about, I think, 10 different Sanghas. There's the Bhikkhuni Sangha, there's the Bhikkhu Sangha, there's the uh, Upasaka Sangha, there's the Upasika Sangha, that's four, right? And you can call them all Sangha. Or you can include the, sang, uh, uh, the other Sangha of the four stages, Magga and Pala, which makes eight, right? So, uh, but ultimately you can come up with, roughly speaking, ten different Sangha, right? So we have to also uh, delineate, clarify what we mean by Sangha. So what I'm saying is, uh, as far as the Dhamma is concerned, so I don't care about this, ultimately, to give a person the title of a Sangha, you know? Uh, because even on the mundane level, that is debatable. Sometimes you go to some place where they don't respect your tradition, whether they're monks or lay people. 
I was in Hawaii once. I was in the market and I saw these two uh, Asian ladies and they looked at me and I could see it in their face, the perplexity. Should we go? Should we, should we not go? His skin color is different. His robes are different. He's like, should we go to Anjali? Should we bow? Should we say Sadhu? Should we say Ajahn? Should we say Bhante? Ah, we just turn around and walk away. That's what they did. But had I on me the robes that they are traditionally used to seeing, totally different reaction. That would make me a Sangha in their eyes. Now, that's lay, lay people I, I, I was referring to. You have the same mentality with monks. So, uh, but these are, again, these have to do with wrong view. All of these things that I, I just mentioned. At. Unless you're talking about the Mahasangha as it relates to the eight levels. That is what I consider Sangha. Uh, and that's why I don't uh, respect simply a person's seniority based on their vassas. And that's why I talked about this and referred to the suttas many, many times here. Patamanidasa sutta and Dutiyanidasa sutta, which no one reads, no one talks about. In it, Lord Buddha is clearly delineating as to the criteria that make a person superior in the Sangha. Hmm? Yeah, Arya, of course. Now, he was talking specifically about monks also, beyond just Arya. But no one talks about that. So these are unnecessary and kind of outdated, antiquated ways where people are becoming very much uh, following a system that no longer is is substantially practicing the Dhamma. And that's why I highly am encouraging of each of you to be practicing the Dhamma. And don't look down upon yourselves. Don't think of yourselves as anything less than a person in robes, as long as you're talking about the Dhamma, the depth of Dhamma, and the thirst for Dhamma, and the practice of Sila Samadhi Panya. Sila Samadhi Panya is crucial. Don't think that that comes with robes, okay? It doesn't. They don't. The three trainings are only in your heart. The attainments are only in your heart. They have nothing to do with your attire or your hairstyle. They have nothing to do with it. Those days are gone. If the Dhamma, which by the way has very limited time on this planet, it's dying at a very, very fast rate. The teachings of Lord Buddha, I mean. It's dying, let's be honest. And that's why I'm so adamantly driven to do what I'm doing and continue to do so. And that's why, you know, it's, it's not joined by others. There are some, very few in the world. I know of only one monk who has uh, such a strong position. Unfortunately, the other uh, one uh, um, died. Uh, he was uh, Mahatera and he was uh, uh, in Sri Lanka, Bhantanyananda. But unfortunately, people are people you will become persecuted and pushed aside like he was pushed aside, despite him being such a giant. And plus he was an Arahant. Nobody talks about it. They talk about Ajahn so-and-so, they have the Ajahn this and so-and-so. Just his books, just pick any of his books. Any. Thin, thin, thin. Each line is loaded with Dhamma. He was an Arahant. But you're not going to find people who want to claim him as their teacher because he was not famous. That's another thing. People want to be the students of this arahant that is recognized. I am the student of this, that, Ajahn, or this something. You pick. <laughs> it just shows about the, the fickleness of human nature. You have a lovely smile, by the way. Thank you. <laughs> I may not be, it's uh, just a bit uh, uh, deviating from a thing, yeah? 
Throughout the talk today, I found you were emphasizing on a person coming from the passenger seat to the driver's seat, mm. right? According to the Hindu, they believe in the caste system. The caste system is based on how far the mind has evolved. It's not based on economic uh, position or whatever. It's purely how far your mind has evolved. So now the Gautama Buddha does not believe in the caste system, but during at his death bait, he said, he said to his followers, do not follow my teaching out of respect. Do all the readings available wherever it is, and what appeals to you, follow that, he said. So we, we're talking about Dharma, it's not easy to be followed if our mind has not evolved to that state. Is, is that your question, sir? Yeah. Or, oh, okay. Is it is it then uh, to follow the Dhamma? What if your mind hasn't reached that stage? Is it uh, possible? Is it isn't it too difficult? Would that be your question? Yeah, that's what I said. Mm -hmm. The mind must take its natural course. Ah, natural course. We ah. can't force the mind to say this is the way to be done. Mm -hmm. Uh, when I read that, when Lord Buddha said that, I liked it because he found that I can't tell the people that this is the way you must do, but mm -hmm. they have to follow according to their dharma, maybe? Uh, that is not from the, the Buddhist tradition, as far as I know. That was uh, from something else. I don't know what. But uh, that's why I've always encouraged individuals to look at their sources because today anybody could write anything about anyone, about any, especially when you add the factor of time. We're talking about 2,600 years almost. Uh, they've even made him into an avatar in, in India. Has nothing to do with Buddhism, but they saw how much public there were. So it's a very interesting tactic, you know, sociological, economical, all these things. And guess what? Many people, droves of them, went and joined and disappeared. Buddhism, that was not the only factor, of course. But people were lazy. People love rituals. That's why most temples, when you walk in, Buddhist temples, most temples you walk in, you will see statues of uh, devas, usually. Uh, and they've even brought that image into, like, idolatry, into the Dhamma. Lord Buddha was even against using his own image, even any image. He really put a like a resistance to Venerable, Sa uh, Venerable Ananda when Venerable Ananda wanted to build shrines here and there because he saw what people liked. Okay, he was very much of a politician, diplomat, all these things. He knew what was going on, what would sell. So even when it was a matter of stupa building, Lord Buddha was, you can, I like to think of it as he got frustrated and he just took his bowl, flipped it upside down and said, okay, there you go. That's the design because they came to him asking, Bhante, what should be the shape? Like, are you kidding me? I'm teaching you the Dhamma to break free from samsara. You're coming here talking to me about how should the stupa be? What style? Take the bowl, flip it upside down. There you go. Go away. Up until the end, Mahaparinibbana Sutta, you see Venerable Ananda still coming, like nagging Lord Buddha, who is just looking for anybody who's ready. I'm about to die. The Buddha is about to die. And he's saying, who's ready? Just, just bring me anybody who's thirsty, who's really close, and I, I, I can help them to become Arahants. And a few people did. Here, Venerable Ananda comes and says, Bhante, how should we arrange your funeral? Who should we, how should we divide the relics? To add some human elements to it, you can see almost like Lord Buddha saying, are you kidding me? You're a bhikkhu, and after I taught you for all these years, you still are not an arahat because you don't practice, and you're coming to me as a bhikkhu, talking to me about death rites, funeral rites, relics, but that's what we have come to do these days. 
people talk about, oh, does the, you know, relics, relics, relics. Every temple happens to have Buddha, Buddha relics. How is that possible? Every temple, if you just calculate and do the math, it's impossible. It's impossible to have that many relics. And we know from the text, from the Mahaparinibbana Sutta, there was only a few portions. But if you have something like a nice little stupa, and there's huge businesses, Thailand, Burma, Sri Lanka, people build these lovely ornate things and they put something in there, it's like, yes, that's the Buddha's relic or something. This is very lame, cheap, has nothing to do with the Dhamma. Of course, there are relics. The tooth relic, etc., some relics in, in Burma, Venerable Sariputtas, Mahamuggallanas. I've been around some. In Kushinara, there's, there's some real relics, but they're not as many as you would be seeing around you. But coming back to you, what you said directly, Lord Buddha, I don't see him ever saying such a thing. Because if that's the case, then you would never grow. You had to go to school. English did not come naturally to you. You forced yourself. Somebody even forced you. You cried and kicked and screamed, but you learned. Walking, that didn't come naturally. You struggled against gravity. So if that's the case, we would still be swinging from trees. That is very similar to Abrahamic religion. No, absolutely not. Abrahamic religions cannot hold a candle. Now, I come from one. Christianity, and I was actually studying to become a monk, Christian monk. I was in monasteries. That's not it. So what? that's one of the reasons is, uh, you know, when people, even I've seen some monks compare, uh, Buddhism is the same as Christianity, like Buddha is the same as this, and you see those interesting pictures, they put them next to each other, Jesus, this, that, and Buddha. What's wrong with you? You know, uh, obviously this person is trying to compare apples and oranges, we say. They have no idea. They're bringing down the Dhamma to their level of understanding. That's the problem. So uh, I've studied Hinduism, uh, but I'm not an expert at it. I've studied Ayurveda, I'm a yoga instructor, all these things I've done for a long time. But I'm not an expert. I don't call myself an expert. Uh, however, I encourage people to go ahead and study uh, before talking to me. In the U.S. it would happen. People, uh, you know, Westerners, somebody who happened to have read uh, a book on Buddhism by a Christian priest, pastor in fact. And that was their education in Buddhism and that's what they were using to argue with me on the premises of Buddhism. And I said, where are you coming from? I'm sorry. It, it doesn't match the level. You need to go and people have motives, hidden motives. I'm trying to bring it down to my level so I can say, yes, this is it. It's not it. So if you're going to compare something, I highly encourage you to go ahead and Explore it, understand it fully, be, and be ready to challenge your old beliefs and walk away from some of them. That's why the greatest minds in India at the time went and became students of Lord Buddha. The greatest. Western philosophers today boast and say our schools are this and that, or Greek philosophy, they cannot hold a candle to the philosophical schools of India at the time, 2,600 years ago. Because all of those schools existed then. And many of them ended up becoming Lord Buddha's students. So I highly recommend studying this. Otherwise, it's like somebody who knows, I don't know, Arabic, and then compares the Chinese literature to some grammatical structure that they see and understand in Arabic. It doesn't work. Apples and oranges. You can't compare Italian with Swahili. It doesn't work. So we need to respect what it is and come from there. Uh, but as far as your references, I don't know them. And I've never seen them all these years of studying and translating suttas. I've never encountered such a statement from Lord Buddha. If anything, it's the opposite. It's the opposite because the word that we look for is aditana. That means 
breaking free. It, it talks about the determination of the person to break free. Every time to, you stand up, you're actually practicing aditana. You might not know this. Every time you stand up, every time a tree pushes against the ground, pushes out, again, stands, it's practicing, in a sense, aditana. I mean, I'm just using the example freely, but as far as a human is concerned, you're standing against gravity. That will that a human being has, we cannot minimize it. And that's all about the Dhamma. That's why it's not a belief, it's a practice. It's a practice. You can't do, just do some pujas and some this and that, and that's it, we're good to go. No, it's a practice. But practice means working against our natural tendency to be lazy. I don't care what skin color you have, what culture you come from, lazy. That's what we are, including devas. Makes no difference. You have to work. If you've ever seen a child, an infant that crawls and then gets up on the feet, how many times do they have to fall? A lot. But they get up. Somebody pulls them up. Somebody pulls them up. Finally, they do it. And it's like, yes. That's the Dhamma practice. So I hope that helps. Let us uh, transfer some merits. <clears throat> Akasatha Chabumata Deva Nagamahidika Punyantang Anamoditva Chirang Rakhan Tuloka Sasana Akasatha Chabumata Deva Nagamahidika Punyantang Anamoditva Chirang Rakhan Tudesana Akasatha Chabumata Deva Nagamahidika Punyam Tangan Moditva Chirangara Kantu Mamparanti Sadhu 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 May you be well. May the blessings of the Triple Gem be with you all.